Our next speaker is Mr. Rajesh Bhatia, CIO at ITI Mutual Fund. Mr. Bhatia has over three decades of experience in fund management, having managed mutual funds, long short funds, and portfolio management services. His topic is very interesting, the rise of alpha. Over to you, Mr. Bhatia. Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Rajesh Bhatia. I am a money manager, uh, and I'm new to the mutual fund business, although you know, as Sir pointed out, I've been in the fund management business or uh, money management business for the last three decades or so. Um, so I just wanted to share with you a money management money manager's perspective. You know, you, I want you to uh, get into the brain of a, uh, a fund manager. Um, I think you've heard enough of where the India story is going. I mean, there is no question that we are very fortunate to be in a country like India today. Uh, I think as Mr. Kulkani was pointing out uh, as well, when you travel across the world, whether it is China, Europe, the United States, or Japan, and fortunately I've gone to all of these countries. Uh, I've spoken to several people, including large investors. Uh, at this moment, the entire spotlight is on India. Everybody wants to know the India story. Everybody wants to be a part of the growth miracle that is happening uh, in India over the next three to five or seven or 10 years. Uh, there is growth coming out of India's ears. We are going to be a $10 trillion economy as you move forward. And the predictability of that happening in the eyes of most global investors is the highest. So I'm not going to bore you more about the India opportunity. I think uh, uh, everybody's on board. Uh, on that aspect, but I wanted to dwell uh, a little bit on what the fund manager is thinking today. Uh, some of it is a little uh, esoteric, but I think I, when I asked my colleague, whom am I speaking to and what is their job, he told me their jobs are two. Uh, they allocate assets and they spot good fund management houses. So I said, okay, then I think it's very important to, for them to understand what I'm going to talk about which is the rise of alpha. So, uh, what I wanted to talk about is, which isn't talked about too often, uh, which the fund management community knows, but I don't think it's talked enough about amongst investing circles, which is that the world has changed. I don't think it is appreciated enough among financial market observers that the world has changed. So how has it changed? that the changes are twofold. One is as far as economics are concerned, and one is as far as geopolitics are concerned. What is the change in economics, and why is that relevant to you? You know what happened during the great financial crisis of 2008? Uh, there was a phenomenon called quantitative easing. What this meant is that the top 10 central bankers of the world unleashed a lot of money into the system. I'm sure you would have heard about the quantitative easing mechanism. Uh, and that led, of course, to drops in interest rates. But it was even more with stronger force post-COVID because the developed markets did not want a depression, which is the worst form of recession you can ever have. I don't know if you, how many people of you are familiar with 1929 depression of the United States. It was extremely brutal. 25% of United States population was unemployed. Uh, so clearly the central bankers had learned that lesson and when COVID struck, they were fearful and they said, we are a developed nation, we can afford to print this kind of supply of money. That is exactly what they did. What was the result of that? Interest rates collapsed. Do you know at one point of time, there was 18 trillion, trillion with a T, trillion dollars of bonds which are quoting in negative territory. It was the world upside down. You know, fixed income was no longer fixed, right? There was no fixed income and fixed income. Uh, 18 trillion dollars of bonds were in negative territory. So I don't know if you noticed or observed, we were facing COVID in India, but the market went up from April 2020, straight up, 16 months in a row, right? Why did that happen? Did you understand why did that happen? It was because interest rates collapsed and the, the result of that is all asset prices went up. 
including Indian equity. So it is not only Indian equity that went up, every equity market in the world went up, every asset class uh, uh, went up. It was called the everything bubble. It is an important aspect to understand. This trend is an extremely important trend for you to understand as asset allocators. Now, there is of course implication of this kind of money supply, which is that inflation manifested itself. So as soon as that happened, by the way, all markets peaked in October 2021. So, so it was not only India that peaked, uh, synchronistically, uh, synchronistically, all global markets also peaked. And in spite, and we, are, we know there's a lot of talk about how India is a phenomenally resilient market, but you must understand that we have raised record sums of money in the mutual loan business in the last 12 to 18 months. And in spite of that, we have a 4% return uh, in the uh, current year. Uh, so you can understand the global forces at play which can impact our markets as well, right? So that is the first, I wanted to understand that that is the first change that has taken place that a lot of market actions are determined now by the world's central banks. And what is the implication of that? I'll get into that. The second important aspect of the world has changed is geopolitics. Now, I don't know how much, how much there's debate on this, uh, at least in our Indian financial markets, but it used to be a synchronous global US-centric world which was uh, abetting globalization, right? China was manufacturing, US was consuming, it was all a globalization trend that was taking place. That has broken. And now there are two blocks that are emerging, uh, US and China, and they are competing for each other. And that has implications for supply, demand, economic cycles, etc. So I just want you to keep that framework in mind that the world has changed and it has implications for economies and it has implications for markets and that's for relevant for you to know. So this is the chart that I was talking about at one point of time, 18 trillion dollars of bonds were in negative territory. Uh, all of that has collapsed, fortunately, and uh, they are down by 99% in terms of bonds which are quoting at negative yields, no longer. Uh, the world, uh, of course, is moving towards positive, real interest rates uh, uh, as you move forward. Right? Now, not only did the central bankers uh, push in a lot of money, this time, even the governments got into action. And they put in a lot of money. The, the fiscal deficit, which is the government re, uh, expenditure minus revenue, the deficit that is caused in the US, which is 25% of the world in terms of GDP, was the highest since the Second World War. So again, they were pushing in a lot of money as well. And there has been record debt levels that have been created uh, ac across the world. So this has, which means that the game that they are playing has limits. Uh, and the debt levels are going to cause limits to those. Uh, now we have entered what I call the monetary policy Abhimanyu Chakra. So what has happened? They pushed in a lot of money. You had inflation. Now there is inflation, you have to bring that inflation down, you raise interest rates. It, it, it was the interest rate increases that have taken place globally have been the fastest in a record level of time. And that leads to recession. Of course, given democracies, there is very little tolerance for recessionary conditions. What's going to happen is soon they will go back to easing uh, uh, and reducing interest rates. What that will mean is again asset prices will go up. So can you see what I am saying? The central bankers push in more money, inflation happens, recession happens, uh, 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 they pull in money, recession happens, they again pull in, put, uh, put more money in and again asset markets go up. So there is a, a, a chakra view that is difficult to get out of, which means what is happening is market cycles are getting shorter, uh, you know, and so are economic cycles. Uh, that has implications for you, you know, as you move forward as asset allocators. And the world is extremely synchronous. So please do not think that if this is happening in the developed world, it has no implications for us. All markets are acting in unison. So again, like I said, asset markets have become correlated. Today, debt and equity markets globally, they lost $35 trillion 
in 2022, right? Both markets together. It used to be a earlier, in the earlier era, before this quantitative easing one and two, the, if, if equity went down, debt gave you returns and the other way around. But today, asset markets are getting correlated and again, that has implications for you as asset allocators. So what, what am I really trying to talk about? It's an esoteric subject, but this is a framework that you need to understand. Right? So I'm not asking you to predict what is going to happen as you move forward. Even I can't predict it and I, I do this every day. But you have to understand that the world has changed, that the market cycles are going to get shorter, that it is being caused by central banker policy. And therefore, when you allocate assets, please know that cycles are going to be shorter. Uh, and that are, you know, you will know why interest rates are going up the way they are and why interest rates fall when they fall. Uh, and why economic cycles become shorter, it has an implication on understanding the market cycles for you as you move forward. The second aspect I spoke about, given that so much money has come into the Indian equity system, Mr. Kulkarni talked about you must sometimes you forget the basics. The basics of investing is risk return paradigm. I think somewhere because so much money has come into the Indian equity markets, I think that risk return paradigm is somewhere lost. You know, somebody gave me a chart yesterday which said, with, of that 1,000 crore plus market cap companies in India, 300 uh, companies of that have price earnings ratio of 50 or more. Those are expensive uh, 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 stocks. Uh, and I think there is a narrative amongst fund managers, particularly I see that in India, where they say, I want to invest in consistency of a company or I want to invest in predictability of a company and I can invest in the, at any price earnings ratio, even if the earnings growth is mediocre. I can absolutely tell you that that's not going to work. That's not the paradigm on which uh, uh, fund management alpha is going to get created. You need to have a certain sense of risk return. You know, I've been fortunately exposed to some of the best investors in the country and globally. And I can tell you, the first thing that they ask when you're evaluating an investment is, how much am I paying? What do you do when you buy real estate? Will you buy real estate in MG Road at any price, just because it's MG Road? You're going to first ask, is this a good investment based on price? Right? So I think that basic is somewhere lost. Uh, we can see that with the price earnings ratios of several companies in the, in, in the markets as, we, as they quote today. And I can tell you for sure that if you pay an expensive price today, you are actually taking away returns from the future. So when you evaluate fund managers, please ask them, what is your risk return philosophy? Because if their philosophy is to buy digital companies which are evolving business models at any price, or if they want to buy consumer companies with extremely high price earnings, uh, with very mediocre earnings growth, I can tell you, 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 have, you have to make a selection whether that guy is going to create alpha or not. Because the alpha guy is going to be far more diligent as far as risk return is concerned, and that's the basics of investing. So I think those are the real two points I wanted to leave you with as asset allocators and as fund manager selectors that one, the market cycles are guided by central banker policy, so when you observe that, you know where it is coming from. And the second is, what is going to be important from a fund management perspective as you move forward? You have to keep the basics of risk return in mind when you evaluate uh, fund managers for your clients' portfolios. So, you know, I, I think there is enough conversation around uh, where the India India is going, but uh, and there is great optimism. I'll just I'll just give you a few instances. You know, I'll give you an example of the software sector. You know, we are in Bangalore, and what a success story the Indian IT companies have been. Do you know that five million people are employed in the Indian IT services business? And Satya Nadella, he's in he's in Bangalore today as well. He has said that. Of the 2,000 companies uh, globally, the top 2,000 companies, they are spending today 4% or 5% uh, of GDP on tech. They will have to spend 10% of GDP uh, in tech. You know, as Mark Anderson said, software is eating the world. 
There's software in your car, there's software in planes, there's software in enterprises. Now, when this goes up by a fraction of 5% to 10%, and by the way, GDP also goes up, that's a lot of demand for software creation. Which country in the world is going to give you 5 million engineers? Which country in the world is going to give you 500,000 incremental engineers? I can tell you the Israel or, you know, uh, places like uh, um, anywhere in the world, uh, Ireland, for instance, they don't even have 500,000 engineers in total. Uh, Russia is out of the equation. Russia has engineers, but I don't think the Americans or the Europeans are interested in buying software from Russia anymore. So it's India. So India exports $180 billion of software exports. In the next 5, 7, 10 years, it's going to be $500 billion. The number of people employed in the software business is going to more than double because India is going to be the only source of such kind of manpower. Now, that has profound implications. All of these guys are going to come out. These guys will get jobs. They're going to come out and buy a Maruti. They're going to buy an SUV. Uh, they're going to buy a house. The demand for commercial real estate is going to explode. The demand for residential re real estate is going to explode. This is just one driver of India growth story. If you talk to Deepak Parekh, and I spent one day in HDFC Bank's earnings meeting, and what they were saying is that they're the most excited about real estate uh, uh, cycle, uh, you know, in, as they've been in the last 25 years. Now, that's a very profound statement. Do you know what is the largest investment in India? It is not infrastructure investment. It is not industrial capex. It is real estate. And when real estate cycle starts, that's a tremendous pull to the India growth story. Because real estate, apart from being such a capital intensive business, pulls 175 other sectors. When you build a house, you need taps, you need tiles, you need electricity, you need fans. There are 175 industries, sand, cement, think of everything, which will get pulled up. So, this is another aspect uh, of, of uh, uh, India growth story, which I think will have profound implications as you move forward. The third is make in India. Um, I can tell you that a lot of people just want to move out of China. And Apple is a phenomenal example. Uh, they're stuck with uh, not having an Apple 14 phone. You know, I, I was looking for an Apple 14 phone when I was in Singapore. My son was in America. There is no Apple 14 phone. Uh, and so basically Apple is, of course, freaking out because it's a $2 trillion economy, uh, uh, company. It was a $3 trillion uh, company just last year. And it's losing its market cap because they are dependent on China. So now they have to pull the entire ecosystem of manufacturing cell phones and to come into India. Again, that has profound implications for semiconductor and electronics manufacturing for India. So I think there is enough, I can give, go on and on, but I think the point is extremely well made, that India is a phenomenal story from our next three, five, seven, ten year. But don't let that narrative blind you from what is happening in the world and why economic and uh, 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 monetary cycles uh, are uh, exhibiting themselves. And second is, please do not let them tell you that price doesn't matter. The India growth story is great and risk return is of no importance because that's not the way that Alpha is going to be generated. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Mr. Bhatia. Nice, uh, succinct presentation. Lot of takeaways. Thank you so much. May I call on stage Mr. Mahadeva Basappa of uh, Shivamoga, Mr. Raghu NS, and Mr. Moka Shivakumar to come on stage, please. Ah, I have run out, end of the day, I have run out of punchlines. Punchlines are not written here. Punchlines are, you should have given me some punch dope. <laughs>